We turn now to a developing story about a mass overdose in Wilton Manor. Six spring breakers were rushed to the hospital, including cadets from the U.S. Military Academy, West Point. And now the Wilton Manor's police department tells us an arrest has been made in this incident. We don't know if it was somebody who was staying at that Airbnb, but they just have made an arrest. Police also believe those students took cocaine that was laced with fentanyl, a substance South Florida is having a hard time controlling. CBS 4's Joel Waldman spoke with the city's mayor about the problem and has the details. A day after first responders dressed in hazmat suits with oxygen tanks on responded to a group of West Point cadets who OD'd on fentanyl laced cocaine, a sobering update from the mayor. There's two that are in ICU, but one is critical. Uh, the other ones have been uh, sent home. Wilton Manor's mayor, Scott Newton, telling us one of the two in ICU is, quote, touch and go. These two men emerging from the backyard of the vacation rental home Friday afternoon. The mayor stunned to learn the four who OD'd and the two who got sick from cross contamination performing CPR are West Point cadets. I was actually shocked that, you know, they're football players, some are football players, and they're doing that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I feel bad for the families and for them. Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue confirming fentanyl laced cocaine was the culprit, a potentially deadly combo. Fentanyl is a hundred times more powerful than morphine. Even if it's in the air and it's a vapor, it can cause people to stop breathing. We're looking at a couple of grains, maybe a couple of grains of salt worth of car fentanyl, which appears to be the most potent fentanyl analog, um, which was actually designed originally to be an elephant tranquilizer. Um, if taken and ingested by a human being, will kill them instantaneously. A lot of people out there don't realize that a lot of substances now are laced with fentanyl, not just opioids, but cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine. Five of the six overdosed appear to have cheated death. One continuing to cling to life, according to the mayor, who fears we could see this spring break scenario play out again. I'm scared to death that it's going to repeat itself. I mean, not just here, anywhere in the country, if you really think about it. If it was done here, you know it's done somewhere else. The now, the city of Wilton Manors has some tips in case you come across someone who has overdosed. Call 911 immediately. Administer Narcan if available. Try to keep the person awake and breathing. Lay the person on their side to prevent them from choking and stay with that person until emergency assistance arrives. Meanwhile, the mayor expects to have another update a little bit later today. We continue to follow the Russia invasion into Ukraine. Ash falls from the sky as black smoke billows into the air. These are images of the city of Dnipro, a city in the middle of the country, a long way from the nearest Russian troops on the ground. One civilian was killed, a primary school, apartment buildings, and a shoe factory all destroyed. Experts say the city and the site hit by that bomb has no military value, but it marks a new stage of the Russian invasion to try to break Ukrainian resistance by targeting civilian areas and innocent people. But the hope in Ukraine is not gone, and a video that recently went viral proves just that. This is seven year old Amelia, who was at the time of this video when it was shot, was at a bomb shelter in Kyiv. She sang a version of Let It Go from Frozen as a way to lift the spirits of those around her. And this morning, we're happy to report Amelia and her family are finally safe in Poland. A live look at Kyiv right now. Russian forces appear to be making progress from the northeast in their slow fight towards Ukraine's capital. For now, Kyiv remains under Ukrainian control. Explosions have been heard near Kyiv, though, as Russian troops press closer. Fighting continues in the suburbs as well, sending people running for their lives. With the war now in its third week, officials in the U.S. and Europe don't have much optimism that the conflict can be solved in a diplomatic manner. Talks between Russia and Ukraine have yielded no major progress, and even the evacuation routes have been repeatedly attacked and contested. So far, two and a half million people have left the country safely. And here are some trusted organizations that you can donate to to help the people of Ukraine. They include the Convoy of Hope, the Polish Medical Mission, Voices of Children, and the UN Refugee Agency. There are many more, by the way. Just head to cbsmiami.com slash help Ukraine for that full list of trusted organizations. Now to a deadly police-involved shooting in the middle of a busy street in northwest Miami-Dade. Police say it all started with a traffic stop. 
After running a, dead, a red light, a driver allegedly slammed into six other cars, finally crashing into a pillar. This happened on Northwest 67th Avenue and 186th Street. After that crash, the man got out of his car with two kitchen knives as pedestrians were just feet away. Tried to de-escalate the situation and draw his attention away from the community and those in the restaurant. White Latin male continued to engage the sergeant despite numerous commands to place the large kitchen knives down. Did not do so, and unfortunately, the sergeant had to discharge his firearm. Police and fire rescue did perform CPR, but that man died at the hospital. Oh, 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 oh. Caught on camera now, chaos at South Plantation High School after class when students got into a fight in the bus loop. One of them poured a liquid over the other's clothing, and the source tells us that liquid may have been bleach. According to police, a nearby driver intervened to separate the students while a second bus driver ran to get help from school security. Police say the students involved will face the, quote, appropriate disciplinary consequences in accordance with the Code of Student Conduct. Speaking of violence in school, a possible tragedy averted when school employees at Dillard Elementary found a gun inside of a student's backpack. Again, this is elementary school. The student in question, just seven years old. CBS 4's Ashley Dyer has that story. When I woke up and I was looking out my bedroom window, I just seen all the cops. A lockdown at Dillard Elementary School. Police swarmed the building after employees found a handgun in a student's backpack. I can't even put a, to even fathom that thought, you know, a child that young bringing a gun to school. Chanel Hubbard was picking up her granddaughter today when we alerted her to the investigation. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't know anything about that. Because I'm surprised that they didn't shut the school down. Broward County Public Schools releasing a statement reading in part, school administrators immediately placed the school on code red lockdown and safely handled the situation and confiscated the weapon. The student involved will face appropriate school disciplinary measures. Deborah Boskett says she teaches her grandson about the importance of behaving in school and the dangers of guns. So they won't uh, hurt themselves or worse, even kill themselves mistakenly by handling a gun, something that serious. People we talk to say the questions they have would best be answered by the child's parents. Yeah, yeah, like... <laughs> What are they doing? The parents should also shouldn't have something that serious out in the loose and around those kids. And it's just, it's just crazy and senseless. We're still working to figure out how this little boy got a hold of a gun in the first place and what disciplinary actions he faces at the elementary school. We're in Fort Lauderdale, Ashley Dyer, CBS 4 News this morning. Still ahead on CBS 4 this Saturday morning, honoring the top teacher in this week's Miami Proud, how one teacher juggles it all while still putting family first. And it's one of the biggest jazz festivals in the entire country, and it returns to Miami Gardens for the first time since a pandemic hiatus. The headliners coming up. And there is no rain, not just yet. Uh, we do expect showers later on today, but out ahead of this cold front, temperatures are going to really heat up. We're already hitting those low 80s early this morning, and there's that front. Uh, it is coming in quickly into central Florida. All the details on this weekend forecast coming up.
Welcome back. Time now is coming up on 915. This weekend marks the return of Jazz in the Gardens, and I've uh, taken a pandemic break here. The music extravaganza is back, and it's expected to be bigger and better this weekend in Miami Gardens than ever before. CBS Source Trish Christakis has more on the ex excitement. This is a festival for us by us. Emotions running high Friday as the community prepares for one of their largest events. You know, it started in a small parking lot and then it blossomed into this world renowned event. So we're, we're, we're just excited to have it back. It all started with the lunch Friday where they honored women throughout the community. We want to get back to a little sense of normalcy and this Jazz in the Gardens will do just that. What's good for Miami Gardens is good for Miami-Dade County. That means it's good for the people who actually park cars and wait on tables and service hotel rooms and have small businesses. This is how we live and eat in Miami-Dade County. We're a tourism town. We're tourism town, let's not pretend that we're not. What about Rick Ross? This weekend, some other top headliners include Mary J. Blige, her, and Rick Ross, something Mayor Harris says will offer a sense of relief to the community, especially now. We just want this to be a time where people can unwind, put some of their thoughts and differences. We know what's going on in the world today, and just put those aside for just a few minutes, a few hours, and just have a wonderful time. Well, Mayor Harris really driving home the point that he wants everyone to just really enjoy each other's company this weekend and that everyone is always welcome here in Miami Gardens. So the spirits were definitely high here today, and they're hopeful that that will continue throughout the rest of the weekend. Reporting in Miami Gardens, Trish Krasakis, CBS News this morning. People look forward to this all year long. It's a huge festival, and it's going to be warm mm -hmm. out there. If you're headed out there, make sure you're well hydrated because it's going to get steamy. Yeah, and you, it was missed uh, yes. in the past uh, two years. Couple years, yeah. yeah. So uh, it's going to be a fun event, but there's a lot going on in the weather department. So we're going to start off with this morning. So temperatures already heating up to those low 80s. Very warm breeze kicking in. That breeze is increasing, so becoming gusty by noontime. So the gates open, Jazz in the Gardens at three o'clock. Um, and uh, it's going to be hot at that time with highs hitting 89 degrees. We'll probably actually hit that a little earlier than 3 p.m., but it'll still be very, very warm by then. And so that's record breaking heat so far. Not expecting rain until after three o'clock, but it's not much, which is good news. Uh, the front, which by the way, is moving. It is coming in to central Florida right now with a line of gusty storms. Well, that line is going to fizzle out and dissipate before it even gets to South Florida. So we're going to just have quick moving spotty showers. Most of them remaining on the light side as compared to what's happening in central Florida. So uh, that's some good news. Uh, but it's becoming windy. It's going to be windy through tonight. And then once the showers uh, move in and exit the area by around 7 p.m., 8 o'clock tonight, it's going to cool down quickly. So let's talk about the highs. Uh, for Miami, it's a forecast high of 89 degrees, basically a similar across the board. Uh, now for the Keys, will probably remain in the low to mid 80s, but just north of the Keys, definitely the upper 80s and uh, some inland cities could maybe even top 90 degrees. Now, a closer look at the timing of the rain. See how this line breaks apart by three o'clock entering the Everglades area in Broward. So then after that, it's going to be a few showers through Miami Dade and the Keys. And then eventually by 7 p.m., those showers will be well to the east of us. So once the showers end, that's when the cool air arrives. Temperatures are going to go from 89 degrees today's high to 53 tomorrow morning. That is quite the change. So we're dealing with gusty winds. There's a wind advisory, a gale warning for boaters out there. Wind gusts could top 40 miles per hour offshore, 35 miles per hour inland. That's for today. It'll still be breezy tomorrow, but not as gusty. And of course, that's going to make things feel quite chilly in the morning. You'll need a sweater. Tomorrow's high 74 degrees. And again, as far as the rain goes for today, just a few showers between uh, 3 30 through about 6 p.m. Now, mid 80s return into the forecast quickly after this cool down by Tuesday. All right, Jennifer, thank you.
Time now for an all-new Miami Proud. Miami-Dade County Public Schools recently celebrated the top teacher for 2022. Unithia Fox is certainly an inspiring educator, teaching special education math and coaching at the same high school from which she graduated. But her personal story, as CBS anchor Lauren Pastrana shares, putting family first in the toughest of, time, toughest of times is quite remarkable, too. Remember, you started with zero on top, right? Where we know. For almost two decades, Unithia Fox explained algebraic equations to students with special needs. But it wasn't what she planned to do. A COBRA herself, class of 1999, and an accomplished athlete, she set out to be a lawyer. However, a visit to her old school and an encounter with the principal would be a game changer. He was like, hey, we need a volleyball coach. Having played volleyball at the college level, she took the job as well as the role of math teacher and never looked back. It was just a perfect fit. You know, you just, you have your own plans and then, you know, there's, a, there's another divine intervention and that's what happened in that moment. She found her niche connecting with kids who need a special kind of teacher. Every child is different. Um, not just child, children with special needs, every child is different because they have dyslexia or dysgraphia or a delay in learning or speech or anything of, of, of that content, people think that they're not capable. Knowing how capable they are, she is tough but relatable, using the same discipline on the court and in the classroom. Because if you can practice shooting 100 shots, you can practice solving a system of equation. You're going to be able to do, accomplish, and overcome anything you want as long as you want to. It's, it's not a limit, and that's just how I've driven it. That determined spirit shining through when tragedy struck her family twice, losing her niece, a young mother of three, and not long afterwards, her brother Daryl, the children's grandfather. Unexpectedly, but with help from family, she and her husband are raising the young boys. Her youngest was three weeks old. My son was barely one because I had just had my son. Going from one to <laughs> four boys is a lot, but I can do it. We're doing it. And those who nominated her for Teacher of the Year who know how remarkable she is. She is like a second mom. I mean, and she's just still amazed me that she's still accomplishing things. She is a leader. She's a coach. Um, she's a motivator. Uh, that's huge. She was humbled and surprised to be named Teacher of the Year and was celebrated in style. Now she has a new role within the district as a college advisor, coming back to see her South Miami students a bittersweet moment. Oh, I miss you guys. Her motto for students, quite fitting, to always begin again. It doesn't matter where you start, you know, just start. And, and that's, that's my thing. Lauren Pastrana, CBS 4 News. And that's a person making a difference. Incredible lady there. Congrats to her. We are told that she is the second teacher of the year to come from South Miami High School. In a new role, she will be at Mast Academy, helping kids prepare for college and go through the college application process. Still to come on CBS 4 this Saturday morning, if you're feeling stressed when trying to fill up your gas tank, you are definitely not alone here. Up next, a look at prices at the pump and why the governor is not all that happy with President Biden's plan to lower them. Plus, an even longer wait for your tax refund this year should be expected. Up next, the IRS gets real about the struggle it's having to get you your money. CBS 4's Miami Proud is sponsored by FPL. At FPL, we're always planning, preparing, and investing in an energy future Florida can depend on. See how at FPL.com slash value.
Welcome back. Time is 926 this morning. We're taking a look at the gas prices here in South Florida. Right now, the state average jumped to 438 a gallon. It's up six cents from Thursday. In Broward, it's 441 for a gallon of gas. In Miami Dade, it's the state average, 438. Monroe County has the highest price at 450 a gallon. Meanwhile, Governor DeSantis was in Doral speaking against the Biden administration's plans to buy oil from Venezuela in a bid to replace Russian oil and lower gas prices. The plan prompted harsh reaction from the governor. Now, to go in hat in hand and legitimizing Nicolas Maduro, who's been responsible for a lot of atrocities um, and has uh, driven that country um, into the ground, along with, of course, uh, his predecessor, Hugo Chavez. So we are um, you know, here to, to speak out about that. Critics of Maduro point to Venezuela's close ties with Russia, which includes a trade and military alliance. The U.S. imposed sanctions on Venezuela back in 2019 to pressure Nicolas Maduro to leave power. And while the U.S. is now in talks with Venezuela, Washington has yet to ease those sanctions. With prices rising on everything from food to gas, many people are looking forward to their tax refunds to help offset some higher costs. But... This year, the IRS says you may have to wait. They say they're struggling through a backlog of more than 20 million tax returns and other correspondence. And now with tax day looming here, the agency says it's planning to hire 10,000 new employees. They say that their workforce is the same size now as it was in 1970. And yet the U.S. population has grown 60%. The IRS says filing electronically could cut the waiting time from for your refund to weeks rather than months. The IRS also struggled to answer taxpayers' phone calls. Out of 282 million calls last year, the National Taxpayer Advocate says agents were only able to answer about 11% of those. Just a reminder, tax day is April 18th of this year. Still to come on CBS4 this Saturday morning, caught on camera, stranded on a sinking boat. Up next, the one thing the group held on to as they waited for help to arrive. Also in the next half hour, a family demanded justice. Why they say a South Florida officer is responsible for the death of a 13-year-old boy and what they want to see happen immediately. CBS4 this Saturday morning is coming right back.
This is CBS 4 News This Morning. Good Saturday morning, South Florida. I'm Keith Jones. Thank you for being with us. Time is 9.32, and here's what we're working on right now. A family demands justice and a cop to be fired. This after a 13-year-old is killed in a police pursuit. And the family says it's not the first time this officer was involved in something like this. Sparking change, a new law inspired by Mia Marcano is changing the way certain businesses hire certain potential employees. We'll explain Mia's law. And breaking news, an early morning fire ignites in southwest Miami-Dade. What we're learning about this investigation. Lots to get to here in this half hour, but first let's check the Saturday morning weather with meteorologist Jennifer Correa, and we've got weather alerts already. Yes, we do, and mainly has to do with the wind. So wind advisory is in effect for areas, uh, basically all of South Florida, even up through the Treasure Coast. Uh, the wind advisory is in effect through this evening, but through tomorrow morning is that gale warning. Of course, that's for waters offshore. Uh, we're talking about wind gusts potentially hitting 40 miles per hour, uh, but in general, they'll probably be around 35 miles per hour offshore. So boaters just keep that in mind. The wind so far is still out of the south west and then after three o'clock that's when the winds will quickly turn out of the northwest so let's take a closer look at those sustained wind speeds pretty impressive right now how much it's changed from five to ten miles per hour early this morning now 20 mile per hour wind speed out there all across brownward you get down into miami gardens north miami it's 17 miles per hour 16 miles per hour down in florida city country walk uh, the kendall area uh, around 15 miles per hour so you get the picture yes the winds are increasing and so are those wind gusts topping 28 miles per hour in Fort Lauderdale so again the winds turn out of the northwest after three o'clock maybe by 5 p.m. Uh, but basically whether they're coming in from the southwest or from the northwest it's still going to remain a windy day uh, throughout the afternoon and into this evening and once that northwest wind kicks in all temperatures are going to drop especially once that sun goes down we're going to take a look at those temperatures in a few minutes. We'll see in a few. Thank you. Breaking news this morning. This is the scene of an apartment fire in southwest Miami-Dade. Right now we know two people have been transported to the hospital. That fire took place at an apartment building on 18th Street. No word on the condition of the two people transported to the hospital or what may have caused the fire at this hour. We are sad. We want justice and united. We are going to stand and we are going to fight. And this morning, a South Florida family demanding justice after a boy riding his dirt bike is killed in a high speed pursuit. Friday, attorney Benjamin Crump joined the teen's family for a rally outside of the Boynton Beach Police Department to call for the officer's immediate termination. CBS 4's Austin Carter was there. The grieving parents of a South Florida teenager calling for the police officer involved in his death to no longer be on the force. You need to be fired today. 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 You have caused us hell in our life, and enough is enough. In December of last year, 13 year old Stanley Davis III was riding his dirt bike when Officer Mark Schoen tried to pull him over for reckless driving. That then led to a chase and then a crash where the teen died. In surveillance video, you can see the boy pull out of a gas station on a dirt bike, and the officer follows shortly before the crash. My family has been divided. My family has been torn by this incident that Mark Sean has created. Here it is almost three months later and we still have no answer. Attorneys working the case say Officer Schoen has a lengthy list of unlawful behavior and was involved in a total of three high speed deadly chases, all of the victims African American. This has captured the attention of civil rights attorney Ben Crump attending Friday's rally. I haven't seen anything like this. Yeah. Somebody with his rap sheet. I mean, he gives Derek Chauvin a run for his money in Minneapolis who killed George Floyd. So what is it? That's what we're talking about today. And Boynton Beach PD says that there is no dash cam footage of this incident because the officer's vehicle was not equipped with the dash cam. In Boynton Beach, I'm Austin Carter, CBS4 This Morning. And right now, a live look at Ukraine's capital, Kyiv. Russian forces appear to be making progress from the northeast in their slow fight toward Ukraine's capital. For now, Kyiv remains under Ukrainian control. 
Earlier this morning, Russian rocket attacks destroyed a Ukrainian air base in the town near the country's capital. The rocket attacks also hit an ammunition depot. The city's mayor says she hoped the area would be able to open up its humanitarian corridors for thousands of residents in nearby cities. The Ukrainian government says Russia's military has also shelled a mosque, sheltering more than 80 people in the besieged city of Mariupol. There are no reports of casualties as of just yet. A lot has been said about Russia's false messaging about the invasion as well. In an effort to keep the people of Russia in the dark, most social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, have been banned. All independent media has left the country at this point in fear that the truthful reporting will land them in prison. So far, the propaganda has been working, instilling major rifts between friends and family members. In fact, one woman who lives in Ukraine says she stopped talking to her own mother, who lives only an hour away in Russia. Until today, she don't believe me. Like, she is my mother. I'm telling her what is happening, like, uh, that we are going to shelters, you know, to we hear bombs, there is, like, attacks. And she said she's, she's not believing me. So I stopped talking to her because, like, what can, like, I, I can't. If she don't believe she's her own daughter, she's all, like, totally brainwashed from TV, you know, because their TV is, all, like, all about this propaganda. In response, some are trying to fight the misinformation by picking up the phone and making cold calls to Russians. A project by the name of Hashtag Call Russia is pushing the campaign on social media and on their website called Russia.org. They're asking Russian speakers to make the phone calls and billing it as the most important call of their life. Call Russia could be the only option for people in Russia to get any alternative uh, information that they used to have. Last week, the Russian government voted to jail anyone who publishes what they consider fake news about the war or uses the word invasion when describing Russia's military action. And here's some trusted organizations you can donate to to help out the folks of Ukraine. They include the Convoy of Hope, the Polish Medical Mission, Voices of Children, and the UN Refugee Agency. And there are many more for you at our website, cbsmiami.com slash help Ukraine. We have a full list for you there. Now to the controversy surrounding the Don't Say Gay bill. Disney spending all, uh, suspending all political donations in Florida due to this bill. In a statement, Disney CEO Bob Chappick apologized to colleagues and the LGBTQ community, saying, quote, you needed me to be a stronger ally in the fight for equal rights, and I let you down. I am sorry. Disney donates tens of thousands of dollars to Florida politicians every year. Well, in the last two years, Disney reportedly donated close to $300,000 to members of the Florida legislature who supported the bill and $50,000 to Governor Ron DeSantis himself. Nearly five months after Mia Marcano's tragic death, the state Senate has passed a law in her name. Mia's law requires landlords of non-transient and transient apartments to require employees to undergo background screenings as a condition of employment. Marcano was 19 years old when police believed she was killed by a man who worked at her apartment complex. According to investigators, Marcano repeatedly rejected his romantic advances. Marcano's family says her memory will live on through Mia's law. What we hope to accomplish is that we don't ever have, or no, ev no family ever has to go through what we went through with our daughter. Um, that's one of the, that's the main goal through the foundation that, to help that nobody has to relive this nightmare that we, that we have right now. Mia's law just needs the governor's signature to become law. It did pass unanimously, by the way. Right now, the family of Gabby Petito is preparing to take the parents of Brian Laundry to court. Petito's parents claim Christopher and Roberta Laundry knew their son murdered Gabby and were working to help him get out of the country. Petito went missing last summer during a cross-country trip with Laundry. Laundry returned home to Florida, then he too disappeared. Both of their bodies were eventually found. In the lawsuit, Joseph Petito and Nicole Schmidt alleged Brian Laundry told his parents about killing Gabby Petito. They say the Laundries wouldn't respond to them or law enforcement when they asked if Gabby was alive. And if not, where were her remains? The Laundries family attorney declined to comment on this lawsuit. Now to a rescue on the water, and it's all caught on camera. Check this out. This was the scene between Deerfield Beach and West Palm Beach on Friday. That's where first responders found four men in the water after their boat started to sink. The men barely had enough time to put on their life vest. They were holding onto their coolers when BSO Fire Rescue arrived. Fortunately, no one was hurt.
Still ahead on CBS 4 this Saturday morning, one month after holding the official title of Broward County's school superintendent, we sit down with Dr. Cartwright to learn more on what's to come for the school district. And don't get caught off guard. We lose an hour of sleep tonight due to daylight saving time. And along with it come some health risks, believe it or not. The surprising results from several studies coming up next. All right, this cold front, it is coming in hot. It is sweeping in, moving fast across Central Florida and headed towards South Florida by later on this afternoon. So the winds are increasing already out of the Southwest, pumping in that heat. Highs today breaking record temperatures. We're going to take a look at that, but then we get a dramatic cool down uh, by tomorrow with those details after the break. Welcome back, 9.45 is the time. It's been one month since Broward County hired a permanent superintendent, CBS 4's Maribel Rodriguez. Spoke with Dr. Vicki Cartwright about what's ahead, her priorities, and the challenges she's faced. Students first, every time. That's Broward County Superintendent's Dr. Vicki Cartwright's guiding principal. We sat down with her one month after she was officially named the district's permanent superintendent. To my community at large, I'm so grateful for the level of support that you continue to give to our, our students as well as to our staff. Um, I've really been working hard on getting out into communities. She and her team have their boots to the ground, as she likes to call it, going out into the community to get the job done, a job she's been doing since July of last year when she was elected interim superintendent. However, now as a permanent superintendent, there is more she could do. As a permanent, at this point in time, I'm now uh, able to go out and recruit some top talent to bring into the organization, as well as top, uh, tap on the shoulders of some of our top talent that's already here in Broward County um, in order to say, hey, I, I want you to think about applying for this job. And there are two key positions to fill, she says, are at the top of her list. Filling the vacancies uh, for the two deputy positions um, and because we have um, a reorganization that we are going to be doing um, for the district. So I am going to be bringing back a plan to the board in May 
um, in order to look at how are we reorganizing our district level um, positions. She also mentioned the COVID slide among students and staffing shortages is something they are working on and her concern about the so-called don't say gay bill. I'm concerned because what happens now for the children who want to say, hey, you know, I, I identify this way and I'm now identifying as a part of the LGBTQ plus population. How am I going to be treated at school? But above all, she says students and their safety is their top priority. Being able to come in here and really start implementing some out of the box ideas um, in order to help move the organization forward, right? For example, um, we started the school year back in person and we've been able to maintain that throughout the entire year despite the Delta variant, despite the Omicron variant, um, where it was very hard. She also mentioned a proposed referendum she'll be presenting to the board to raise funding to retain teachers and to operate schools. Maribel Rodriguez, CBS 4 News. Well, it's that time of year, time to spring forward. Before you go to bed tonight, don't forget to set your clocks ahead by one hour. And while daylight saving time gives us a little more light, a little bit longer into the night, one downside is you lose an hour of sleep on Saturday nights. And the time change could, believe it or not, have negative health ef uh, effects and impacts. Some studies found here an increase in heart attacks on Monday after the time change. A University of Michigan study found that increase to be about 24 percent. The American Heart Association also reports another study found the risk for strokes increased by 8% during the first two days after daylight saving began. And it's not just health issues here. A University of Colorado study found a 6% increase in fatal car crashes in the week following daylight saving. Researchers say this is due to a kind of a jet lag effect, if you will. Broward Health has some Good advice here, preparing for the time change. Try to go bed 15 minutes earlier than you normally would each night. Don't set an alarm clock for tomorrow morning or the following Sunday. Sleep in naturally and avoid large meals or working out too close to bedtime. The one good thing about daylight saving time is tomorrow we can enjoy some great weather a little bit longer. It'll be a longer day. Yeah, or yeah, like if you like the daylight hours, yeah, yeah it'll be later in the evening. But uh, uh, did you hear that, Keith? Uh, we don't have to set an alarm for tomorrow morning. That's, uh, that's the advice <laughs> I'm taking. Yeah, <laughs> no, I, I do not like spring forward. I'm not forward, forward, spring forward, <laughs> but it's going to happen. I mean, we can't, we, there's no way around it, right? We do lose that hour of sleep. So again, uh, the, let's talk about the sunrise because the sunrise will be later in the morning. Uh, tomorrow, the sun rises at 7.32 a.m. and then the sun will set at 729 p.m. and then moving on towards summertime each and uh, every evening f forward we are going to see the sun setting later and later. All right, let's talk about the front. It is moving into Central Florida this morning and it is moving fast. This is a strong cold front right now. It is bringing some heavy precipitation over parts of Orlando, the I-4 corridor down into Tampa, but by the time it gets down into South Florida, Florida, most of that rain is going to fizzle out out ahead of the front. That's where we are. We're heating things up already. 81 degrees in Miami, Fort Lauderdale. So hitting those low 80s and then by one o'clock topping the upper 80s. In fact, very close to 90. The forecast high today in Miami is 89. That's going to break the record of 80, 87, which was last set in 2014. Let's talk about what we expect after we hit this record high. So by around three o'clock, that's when the front arrives into western parts of Broward. And what you're going to notice is the front is going to move fast with fast moving showers. And by 4 p.m., temperatures are dropping into the mid 70s in Coral Springs Weston, still in the low 80s down south. But look at this temperatures quickly dive into the mid and upper 60s by 8 p.m. this evening. That's why if you're going to be out and about tonight, maybe at Jazz in the Gardens or wherever it may be that you're going, take a sweater with you. I promise you're 
you're going to need it, especially if you're out late because overnight temperatures will fall into those 50s and by tomorrow morning, coastal areas potentially down in the low 50s, which means inland areas look at Weston could go down to 50 degrees, getting close to those 40s. Pretty impressive, right? And then tomorrow morning in the keys of feeling the chill as well, waking up in the low 60s. All right, let's talk about the rain. So take a look at the leading edge of the front it does bring some heavy downpours as it approaches Naples, but as it gets closer to mainland Monroe and Broward and Dade, you notice that the line breaks apart. Only a few quick moving showers between 3.30 and 6 o'clock today. And then we cool down fast in the low 50s tomorrow morning. Tomorrow's high really nice. This is below the average with a high of 73 degrees. So Sunday will definitely be a cool day for March, but we heat things up back in the mid 80s by Tuesday. And now, CBS 4 Sports. Last night, the Heat get back on track with a double-digit win over the Cavs, and in the process, a career mi milestone for Jimmy Butler. Butler would hit the 12,000-point mark for his career, but first, Bam Adebayo jumping out of the building and throwing down on the Cavaliers. He gets everyone on their feet catching this lob, hammering home two of his 30 points. He also had 17 boards. Max Struess had a big night off the bench. He sends Miami into the break with a one-point lead, firing away from deep, but it would be the defense and Jimmy Butler who bring the clamps in the second half. Butler breaks up the pass, then gets free for the dunk. Then on the very next possession, literally just seconds later, Butler picking pockets this time. He's off to the races again. He scores 24 for the 27th time this season. Miami wins by double digits, 117-105. You know, we, we had to lock in on, like you said, they, they beat us twice, so we really had to win this one at home and uh, try to even the playing field. College hoops, the Canes trying to go through Coach K and Duke in the ACC semifinals. Cam Augusti, he's going to be a problem in the tournament. Down two, launching from deep to put Miami up one. He finished the game with 24, but this one ultimately swings Duke's way on this sequence. Wendell Moore blocks Isaiah Wong in transition, then gets back on offense and flies in for the layup. Duke edges Miami 80-76. to Miami has bounced from the ACC tournament, but looks like we'll be seeing them again in the NCAA tournament. Well, the Dolphins place a second round tender on corner Nick Needham. He stands to make just under $4 million next season. What's a second round tender? Well, if another team decides they want to sign Needham, they'll have to send the Finns a second round pick. Spencer Knight's stay in the AHL was very short-lived. The Panthers recalled their young goalie yesterday. He was impressive in his last outing back on March 7th against the Sabres, stopping 29 of the 30 shots he faced. Panthers are back on the ice Sunday against the Kings. I'll do it for sports on my Cunio for CBS 4 this morning. And CBS 4 the Saturday morning is coming right back. But as we had to break a look at the winning lottery numbers.
That does it for this hour of CBS 4 this Saturday morning. Stay tuned now for another hour of news in just two minutes. Good Saturday morning, South Florida. I'm Keith Jones. Time is coming up on 10 o'clock. Here is what we're working on right now. One spring breaker remains in the hospital after multiple students overdosed on fentanyl laced cocaine and police have made an arrest in this case. This morning, what police are now saying about the investigation amid concerns of fentanyl overdoses in the state. Right now, Ukraine's capital is increasingly more in jeopardy of being toppled by Russian forces. This morning, what's taking place in cities all around the capital as soldiers move in. And Jazz in the Gardens is back. The festival kicked off last night, and the big headliners are prepping to hit the stage starting today. A look at what you can expect this year. This is CBS 4 News This Morning. Good morning once again, South Florida. Thank you for being with us. Settle in. Let's get started with a look at the forecast. Here's meteorologist Jennifer Correa with a beautiful start. Look at that shot behind you. Postcard stuff. Yeah, there. yeah, and it's uh, getting gusty, actually. I'm noticing that now the surf is uh, increasing because earlier this morning it didn't look so bad, but notice uh, the palms uh, just swaying uh, briskly. And look at the white cap. So uh, we are seeing those winds increase out of the southwest and then eventually those winds will turn out of the northwest. But uh, let's talk about those advisories. So there is a wind advisory already in effect through this evening, along with a gale warning for our waters offshore over the Atlantic and Gulf Stream. This remains in effect through tomorrow. So wind gusts are going to top 40 miles per hour out there offshore. Uh, but uh, for the most part, it's going to be around 30 to 35 miles per hour still uh, that it's just going to be progressively getting worse through the afternoon. So any boaters out there this morning, just beware about that. Stay safe. Small craft advisory in effect for water surrounding the Keys. Look at these winds sustained at 20 miles per hour across much of Broward, Dania Beach at 21 miles per hour, 18 in Hollandale Beach, as well as in Aventura, and then down through Palmetto Bay, Cutler Bay, Florida City. Wind speeds right now topping 16 miles per hour. So those winds quickly increasing with some wind gusts uh, already hitting 30 miles per hour in Pompano Beach. The front arrives this afternoon. We're going to take a close look at the timing of the front and of course a close look at the cool down that's coming. 
We'll see you in a few minutes. Thank you. Breaking news this morning. This is the scene of an apartment fire in southwest Miami-Dade. Right now, we know that two people have been transported to the hospital. That fire took place at an apartment building on 18th Street. No word on the condition of the two people transported to the hospital or what may have caused the fire at this hour. We begin with a developing story now about a mass overdose in Wilton Manors. Six spring breakers were rushed to the hospital, including cadets from the U.S. Military Academy, West Point. And now the Wilton Manors Police Department tells us an arrest has been made in this incident, although we don't know if the arrest was of somebody who was living at that Airbnb. The group is believed to have taken cocaine laced with fentanyl, a substance South Florida is having a really hard time controlling right now. CBS 4's Joel Waldman spoke with the city's mayor about the problem and has the details. A day after first responders dressed in hazmat suits with oxygen tanks on responded to a group of West Point cadets who OD'd on fentanyl laced cocaine, a sobering update from the mayor. There's two that are in ICU, but one is critical. Uh, the other ones have been uh, sent home. Wilton Manor's mayor, Scott Newton, telling us one of the two in ICU is, quote, touch and go. These two men emerging from the backyard of the vacation rental home Friday afternoon. The mayor stunned to learn the four who OD'd and the two who got sick from cross-contamination performing CPR are West Point cadets. I was actually shocked that, you know, they're football players, some are football players, and they're doing that. I, I, I'm, I'm, I feel bad for the families and for them. Fort Lauderdale Fire Rescue confirming fentanyl laced cocaine was the culprit, a potentially deadly combo. Fentanyl is a hundred times more powerful than morphine. Even if it's in the air and it's a vapor, it can cause people to stop breathing. We're looking at a couple of grains, maybe a couple of grains of salt worth of car fentanyl, which appears to be the most potent fentanyl analog, um, which was actually designed originally to be an elephant tranquilizer. Um, if taken and ingested uh, by a human being, will kill them instantaneously. A lot of people out there don't realize that a lot of substances now are laced with fentanyl, not just opioids, but cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine. Five of the six who overdosed appear to have cheated death. One continuing to cling to life, according to the mayor, who fears we could see this spring break scenario play out again. I'm scared to death that it's going to repeat itself. I mean, not just here, anywhere in the country, if you really think about it. If it was done here, you know it's done somewhere else. Joel Waldman, CBS 4 News. Well, the city of Wilton Manors has some tips in case that you come across someone who has overdosed. Obviously, call 911 immediately. Administer Narcan if you possible. Try to keep that person awake and breathing. Lay the person on their side to prevent them from choking and stay with that person until emergency assistance arrives. Meanwhile, the mayor does expect to have another update for us a little bit later today. We continue to follow Russia's invasion into Ukraine. Ash falls from the sky as black smoke billows into the air. These are images of the city of Dnipro. That's a city in the middle of the country, a long way from the nearest Russian troops on the ground. One civilian was killed here. A primary school, apartment buildings, and shoe factory all destroyed. Experts say the city and the, at the site of where that bomb hit has no military value to it but it marks a new stage of the Russian invasion to try to break Ukrainian resistance by targeting civilian areas and innocent people. But the hope in Ukraine is not gone, and video that recently went viral proves just that. This is seven-year-old Amelia, who at the time of this video was at a bomb shelter in Kyiv. She sang a version of Let It Go from Frozen as a way to lift the spirits of those around her. And this morning, Amelia and her family are finally safe in Poland. A live look at Kyiv now. Right now, Russian forces appear to be making progress from the northeast in their slow fight towards Ukraine's capital. For now, Kyiv remains under Ukrainian control. Explosions, though, have been heard near Kyiv as Russian troops press closer. Fighting continues in the suburbs, sending people running for their lives. With the war now in its third week, officials in the U.S. and Europe don't have much optimism that the conflict can be solved in a diplomatic manner. Talks between Russia and Ukraine have yielded no major progress, and even the evacuation routes have been repeatedly attacked and contested. So far, two and a half million people have left the country safely. 
And here are some trusted organizations that you can donate to to help the people of Ukraine. They include the Convoy of Hope, the Polish Medical Mission, Voices of Children, and the UN Refugee Agency. There are many more on as well on our website, cbsmiami.com slash Ukraine or help Ukraine. You can get a full list of all the legitimate organizations out there. Now to a deadly police involved shooting in the middle of a busy street in Northwest Miami Dade. Police say this all started with a traffic stop. After running a red light, the driver allegedly slammed into six other cars, finally crashing into a pillar. This happened on Northwest 67th Avenue and 186th Street. After the crash, the man got out of his car with two kitchen knives as pedestrians was just feet away. Tried to deescalate the situation and draw his attention away from the community and those in the restaurant. White Latin male continued to engage the sergeant despite numerous commands to place the large kitchen knives down. Did not do so, and unfortunately, the sergeant had to discharge his firearm. Police and fire rescue performed CPR on that suspect, but the man died at the hospital. Oh, 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 oh. Caught on camera now, chaos at South Plantation High School after class when students got into a fight in the bus loop. One of them poured a liquid over the other's clothing. A source tell us that liquid may have been bleached. According to police, a nearby driver intervened to separate the students. Another bus driver ran to get help from school security. Police say the students involved here will face, quote, appropriate disciplinary consequences in accordance with the code, the code of student conduct. Speaking of violence in school, listen to this. A possible tragedy aver averted here when school employees at Dillard Elementary found a gun inside of a student's backpack. That student in question, just seven years old. Again, this is an elementary school. CBS4's Ashley Dyer has a story. When I woke up and I was looking out my bedroom window, I just seen all the cops. A lockdown at Dillard Elementary School. Police swarmed the building after employees found a handgun in a student's backpack. I can't even put a, to even fathom that thought, you know, a child that young bringing a gun to school. Chanel Hubbard was picking up her granddaughter today when we alerted her to the investigation. Oh, that's crazy. I didn't know anything about that. Because I'm surprised that they didn't shut the school down. Broward County Public Schools releasing a statement reading in part, school administrators immediately placed the school on code red lockdown and safely handled the situation and confiscated the weapon. The student involved will face appropriate school disciplinary measures. Deborah Boskett says she teaches her grandson about the importance of behaving in school and the dangers of guns. So they won't uh, hurt themselves or worse, even kill themselves mistakenly by handling a gun, something that serious. People we talk to say the questions they have would best be answered by the child's parents. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> What are they doing? The parents should also shouldn't have something that serious out in the loose and around those kids. And it's just it's just crazy and senseless. We're still working to figure out how this little boy got a hold of a gun in the first place and what disciplinary actions he faces at the elementary school. We're in Fort Lauderdale, Ashley Dyer, CBS 4 News this morning. Still head on CBS 4 this Saturday morning, honoring the top teacher in this week's Miami Proud, how one teacher juggles it all while still putting family first. And what's one of the biggest jazz festivals in the country, and it returns to Miami Gardens for the first time since a pandemic hiatus. The headliners coming up. And we are in for a lot of different types of weather. In less than 24 hours, we start off with the temperatures right now ready hitting the low and mid 80s, 85 degrees in Pompano Beach, 83 in Miami. It is 84 in Marathon. We'll continue to heat things up with a forecast high today of 89. That's going to set a new record. And then we cool down a lot. Those details coming up.
Welcome back. Time now is 1014. This weekend marks the return of the Jazz in the Gardens, and this after taking a pandemic break. The musical extravaganza is back and expected to be a big weekend in Miami Gardens. CBS 4's Trish Christakis has more on the excitement. This is a festival for us by us. Emotions running high Friday as the community prepares for one of their largest events. You know, it started in a small parking lot and then it blossomed into this world renowned event. So we're, we're, we're just excited to have it back. It all started with the lunch Friday where they honored women throughout the community. We want to get back to a little sense of normalcy and this Jazz in the Gardens will do just that. What's good for Miami Gardens is good for Miami-Dade County. And that means it's good for the people who actually park cars and wait on tables and service hotel rooms and have small businesses. This is how we live and eat in Miami-Dade County. We're a tourism town. We're tours from town. Let's not pretend that we're not. What about Rick Ross? This weekend, some other top headliners include Mary J. Blige, her, and Rick Ross, something Mayor Harris says will offer a sense of relief to the community, especially now. We just want this to be a time where people can unwind, put some of their thoughts and differences. We know what's going on in the world today, and just put those aside for just a few minutes, a few hours, and just have a wonderful time. Well, Mayor Harris really driving home the point that he wants everyone to just really enjoy each other's company this weekend and that everyone is always welcome here in Miami Gardens. So the spirits were definitely high here today, and they're hopeful that that will continue throughout the rest of the weekend. Reporting in Miami Gardens, Trish Krasakis, CBS News this morning. Yeah, an exciting time in Miami Gardens. Candace, by the way, did a great interview with uh, Rick Ross. I don't know if oh, you've yeah. seen it. If you haven't seen it, go to our website. Uh, it's neat to see a guy, a local guy, who goes big and he's giving back and he, his excitement to see this festival as well. So I, I digress. Anyway, we need good weather <laughs> for that and we're going to be flirting with uh, record temperatures today. Yes, uh, so when the gates open for Jazz in the Gardens, uh, it's going to be very warm. I mean, hot. 89 degrees is the forecast high. We'll probably hit that around 1, 2 o'clock. And it'll still be in the upper 80s around 3 o'clock. After that, we'll start to drop and really drop. We're talking about uh, potentially a 36 degree temperature drop, isn't that? That's uh, in less than 24 hours. I mean, that is uh, quite the change from 89 this afternoon to 53 degrees. That's the forecast low in Miami tomorrow morning. So, yes, cooling down, not just in Miami, all across South Florida. By tonight, 9 p.m., temperatures start to dip in the 60s, low 60s for northern and a Broward, Miami-Dade, mid to upper 60s, and then even the Keys will start getting down into the 60s at that time. So as we head into midnight, it gets colder into the 50s overnight, and then tomorrow morning, inland temperatures getting very close to upper 40s, a forecast low 51 degrees in Coral Springs tomorrow morning, 53 in Miami, 55 for Lardale, 57 in Key Largo, so even the 50s getting down to the Key now, out ahead of this front, the winds are out of the southwest. They've been increasing throughout this morning, already topping 20 miles per hour and gusting at 30. We'll continue to see those winds increasing. And then by 3 o'clock, that's when the winds start to turn out of the northwest. There, and those uh, that change in the wind pattern begins from north to south. So even though winds start to change later on today, it's still going to be gusty. These are wind gusts inland 30 to 35 miles per hour this afternoon. Offshore 35 to 40 miles per hour. That's why there's that gale warning in place in effect through tomorrow morning for offshore waters in the Atlantic and Gulf Stream. Now, as far as rainfall goes throughout much of this afternoon, nice and dry, but of course very warm and humid. Then by three o'clock showers make their way in from the northwest. But look at this. They really break apart and dissipate. So four o'clock, five o'clock. Yes, we could have a few showers out there, but it's sparse and looks like it's light. Plus they're quick movers. So by seven, 7 p.m. They're out of here to the east of us. And as those winds start to turn, that's when we start to see the temperatures start to cool down. So tomorrow is Calle Ocho, and I believe it begins at 11 a.m. So you'll probably need a sweater in the morning. And then in the afternoon, highs will top 74 degrees. Now, Tomorrow in the afternoon, winds kick back from the northeast, and so that could bring back clouds from the Atlantic Ocean and maybe a few showers for Sunday late in the afternoon, but those showers will be very light. Temperatures rebound into the mid-80s by Tuesday.